Hello, it's Bruce Williams, and today I want to present probably the shortest lecture in my series on selected gross pathology of the ox, which we're going to talk about lesions that are seen in the endocrine system. As I do at the beginning of all of these lectures, I want to thank those folks who provided me images either through online collections or directly, which enable me to put these little lectures together. Our first and most important lesion is an aborted calf. It's difficult to tell this is a calf because of its lack of hair, the severe edema or mixed edema in the skin, and the large ventral swelling. But this is congenital hypothyroidism. And in almost all species, it's associated with the formation of a hyperplastic goiter and results when inadequate maternal thyroid hormone crosses the placenta during development of the fetus. The mother may show no signs of hypothyroidism at all, and the only thing that you might see is a prolonged gestation, a retained placenta, and dystocia. This finding may be seen in all ruminants, pigs, foals, and even some carnivores, but in carnivores it's rarely associated with an enlarged thyroid. Foals with congenital hypothyroidism are generally born extremely weak and die within a few days of birth, but ruminants, provided they are born alive, may survive and even thrive with the condition regressing over time. However, calves that are born hairless with mixed edema like this one are usually born dead or die shortly after birth. Here's a great picture of a hyperplastic goiter in a calf with congenital hypothyroidism and the mechanism is basically the same across the board in all species. The fetus has markedly decreased blood levels of T3 and T4, which sends feedback to the hypothalamus to increase thyrotropin releasing hormone, ultimately stimulating the pituitary gland to increase TSH secretion or thyroid stimulating hormone, and results in hypertrophy and hyperplasia of follicular cells. Interestingly, this condition may result from either decreased amounts of iodine in the mother's diet or increased amounts of iodine. Decreased iodine may result from the ingestion of a number of plants which are broken down into thiocyanase which inhibit the organification of iodine to include white clover, couch grass, linseed meal, and many, many members of the family Brassicaceae, including rape and kale. Thiouracil and sulfonamides may act in a similar fashion. Excessive dietary iodine, which is less common and may result from the feeding of large amounts of dry seaweed, which has a lot of iodine, inhibits the uptake of iodine by blocking the peroxidation of iodide to iodine, interfering with the conversion of monoiodotyrosine to diiodotyrosine, and blocking the release of T3 from the follicle by interfering with the proteolysis of colloid. It may also be seen as a genetic enzyme defect in certain types of sheep, including Corydales, Merinos, and Romneys, San and Dwarf Goats, and Africander cattle. Now don't confuse hyperplastic goiters which, with what is known as colloid goiter. A colloid goiter is actually the involutionary phase of a hyperplastic goiter. When proper iodine levels are established, the levels of thyrotropin are still high. There's a tremendous production of colloid, and you get a thyroid with lots of colloid in it. 
as iodine is established, those levels of thyrotropin go down, and the animal is left with a tremendous amount of colloid in the goiter. Because of the lower thyrotropin secretion and T4 requirements, you will have decreased endocytosis of colloid and this follicular distension, which will normalize over time. But hyperplastic goiters are seen when iodine levels are low and thyrotropin is high, and the resulting colloid goiter is seen when iodine levels are normal and thyrotropin secretion goes back to a baseline. The edema that we see in these hypo hypothyroid animals is mixed edema, not true edema. It's a tremendous amount of ground substance within this tissue. And similar to what we might see in hypothyroidism in the dog, for example, where you got a lot of excess ground substance in the tissues. Okay. That pretty much covers the thyroid gland. Let's move on to the adrenal gland. You can tell you're in the adrenal gland here because we see a cortex and a medulla. The cortex, as is seen in other species, is going to be a nice yellow-orange color because it is producing steroids. And any tissues that produce steroids have a yellow-orange color. The primary component of steroids is fat. So that's why it's sort of yellowish. This fat is broken down and oxidized as part of being converted to steroids. And whenever you break down fat, you get a yellowish color. There is a large neoplasm in the center of this adrenal gland. Now, don't be thrown by the location. You can see cortical tumors in the center of the gland based on how you cut it. But the fact that this tumor is sort of clear with hemorrhage rather than yellow. If it was an adrenal cortical tumor, it would be yellow like the remainder of the cortex. This one is clear. It is hemorrhagic. This is very characteristic of pheochromocytomas in any species. Cattle are one of the species that do get a fair number of pheochromocytomas. They're fairly uncommon in a lot of other species. We also see them with some frequency in dogs and rats. They usually cause absolutely no problem in cattle, but we often see them in cattle as we see them in humans as part of a syndrome of endocrine tumors in multiple tissues, which are lumped under the grouping of men or multiple endocrine neoplasms. In both cattle and humans, pheochromocytomas may develop concurrently with calcitonin secreting C-cell tumors in the thyroid gland, and they're much more common in bulls than they are in cows. These two tumors, as well as a pituitary adenoma, is seen in a familial pattern in Guernsey cattle. This tumor can be diagnosed on the autopsy floor if you have access to Zenker's solution. Zenker's solution contains potassium dichromate. An application to a fresh section of one of these tumors gives a positive chromaffin reaction, oxidizes the calcolamines within the tumors, and will, the tumor will turn dark brown within about 20 minutes. Okay, here's our last slide, and a fun little lesion in the pituitary gland. Here's a pituitary abscess, and you can culture whatever you want from it. Probably you're going to get Truparella pyogenes because these are usually chronic abscesses. Abscesses in the pituitary may be an extension from otitis media, but they also may come from frontal sinusitis resulting from the the positioning of nose rings in bowls. There is a, a large venous plexus 
called the Reedy Mirabile, which runs in the dorsal surface of the sinuses all the way down to the nose and ends up encircling the pituitary gland. So you can get a bacterial infection by putting a nose ring in a bull and it can ascend through the venous sinuses and if it does you will generally end up with a pituitary abscess. Not terribly common but a fun lesion. Okay, well that was a quick review of uh, at least what I know about endocrine diseases in cattle. Uh, next time we will move on to the hematopoietic system and we'll begin our discussion which will pop up in just about every system from here on out on lymphoma and viral pathogenesis of this condition in cattle. So I'll see you next time and have a great day.